Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this episode, we cover a story that has slipped through the cracks of history. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well. So let's get into it. In order for this video to make sense, let's head way back into history, around the year 1850. Because that's when Chinese immigrants first began moving to America. During this time, China was mostly undeveloped and agricultural. And because of this, opportunities to make money were very limited, even for the most skilled people in society. Well, during the early 1850s, word got around that there was a major gold rush happening across the Pacific Ocean. So thousands of families pooled their resources together and decided to take the risk of a lifetime. They took ships and traveled a long, difficult journey across the Pacific Ocean. But sadly, once they arrived, almost all of the gold was already gone. So then these families were faced with a tough decision. They had just spent their last resources to come strike it rich in America, but ultimately that fell short. So, do they stay in an unfamiliar land after not finding what they came here for, or do they return back to the homeland? Well, ultimately, almost all 25,000 decided to stay in California and do whatever jobs they could to survive and assimilate. Many of the men became fishermen and others began working construction, but finding a job was not as easy as it sounds. However, in 1863, that would change as the US announced the construction of the first transcontinental railroad. The plan was to connect San Francisco all the way to Council Bluffs, Iowa, but the government had a major problem. They could barely find anyone to work these jobs. That's because workers had to leave their families for months on end, and on top of this, they would have to go to the middle of nowhere to build tracks all day long. So in order to fill the shortage, the US would somehow get the word out to China, and boom, 300,000 Chinese immigrants came to California to start working. And by 1880, they made up over 10% of the state's population. They began to build their own neighborhoods in California's biggest cities. San Diego, Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Jose, and San Francisco all had large Chinatowns by 1880. But then came 1882, when the US government introduced one of the strangest legislations in American history. That would be the Exclusion Act, and here's what it did. Only Chinese these men could now come to America and they had to leave their wives and children back home. Now, why they enacted this, I don't know. You guys can come up with your own conclusions. I'll just talk about the results. Well, after this passed, a huge problem followed. In 1890, the Bay Area had 89,000 Chinese men. And do you want to guess how many women? Less than 5,000. And because of the shortage, the men began looking for other options. And I know where you guys think I'm going with this, but no, let me explain. In Louisiana, 57% of Chinese men got married to African American women. And in California, 43% married European women. Well, essentially, the act halted the growth of the Chinese American community. And it stayed that way until 1943, when the legislation was finally thrown in the trash. And as soon as this happened, the Chinese population began to grow very quickly. And the majority of them moved to Chinatowns all over California. And that takes us to San Francisco Chinatown, one of the oldest and quietest neighborhoods in the city. But things would begin to change in 1960, and this had nothing to do with Chinatown itself. Let me explain. In 1960, a group of teenagers from Hong Kong moved to San Francisco. They came to escape the chaotic streets of their hometown and expected things to be easy in San Francisco. But they were met with an unexpected surprise. The teenagers began attending Galileo High School, which at the time was one of the roughest schools in the city. It's also famous for OJ Simpson, but that's besides the point. Anyways, while at Galileo, they began running into trouble with students from the Fillmore and Portrayal Hill projects. They recall being made fun of and shoved into lockers on a daily basis. And at first, they decided to play along, hoping that it would smooth out. But after a while, they decided that enough was enough, and they began calling themselves watching also known as Dub C. Once they band together and made a statement, no one at school would ever mess with them again. And remember, these guys grew up in a chaotic environment back home, so this did not phase them one bit. But not only did they associate with each other at school, but in the neighborhood as well. And that takes us to the Ping Yuan Projects, Chinatown's 12-story public housing complex. And this is where the Hong Kong teens were living. And what they didn't know is that it came with certain rules. Let me explain. Chinatown was very 
very well organized, especially when it came to the streets. Everything was controlled by the Tongs, and all this means is a gathering place for an association. Chinatown had multiple Tongs, such as Sing Sui and Hop Sing, and this is who ran the neighborhood. Everything had to pass by them. So once the Tongs got word about a new group called Wa Ching forming in Chinatown, they were not happy, but instead of being confrontational, they decided to handle it another way. They would call for a meeting with Wa Ching and offer to protect them in exchange for monthly payments. And at first, Wa Ching completely laughed at the idea. They thought that it was a ridiculous idea and they were better off protecting themselves. Well, they didn't know much about the rules of Chinatown and how everything operates. Elders are always respected first, and no one does anything without the approval of higher ranking members of the community. And that's that's how money is handled as well. Much of the money came from under the table imports of all kinds of things. And those at the top collected the most money and the younger guys received whatever was left over. So boom, here's the dilemma. Wa Ching can either join together with the Tongs and get in where they fit in, or they can decline and fend for themselves in Chinatown. And this tough decision would actually split up Wa Ching. The majority of members decided that accepting the Tongs offer was the safest route. That would be except for two brothers. Let me introduce you to Joe Fong and Glenn Fong, and these two were the most fearless people in Chinatown. They would decide to break away from Wa Ching after their decision to join the Tongs, and that's when they would create their own group called the Joe Boys, and their motto was to do everything their own way and abide by no rules. And on top of this, their plan was to recruit as many people as possible, and Joe Fong became the Chinese Nick Saban. He went to Oakland, San Leandro, and Hayward to recruit. So the Joe Boys began roaming around Chinatown with their chests out doing whatever they want. And this is when things got serious. So Wa Ching and the Tongs decided to send a message. March 1st, 1970, 11 in the morning. It's a regular day in Chinatown and Glenn Fong steps outside of his apartment. Bang. Although they were trying to humble Joe Fong with this message, they actually made a crazy man even crazier. Joe Fong now has a grudge for the rest of his life, so he would kick off the worst year in Chinatown history. In fact, in 1970, San Francisco had a homicide rate of 28.5 per 100,000, which was actually top five in the country, and most of this was related to the Joe Boys versus the rest of Chinatown. However, the Tongs would keep sending messages, and they would do it in a traditional manner. Two men and one rope. That's all. No bams, just a rope. On November 5th, 1970, they would find a Joe boy named George Yun in the Presidio. Then, two weeks later on November 19th, they would find another Joe boy named Alan Hom. And the craziest thing about it is that for both of them, they used the same rope. And this trend would continue to the point where Chinatown became the most dangerous place to go. And because of this, one of the Joe boys would decide to do something very brave. The man's name is Raymond Leung, and he pulled Joe Fong to the side to tell him to calm down before things get much worse. He was scared for his own sake and for the rivals as well. All of this was destructive and a big waste of time, but this brave suggestion would not work out well for him. The next day, he was discovered in Chinatown. And as soon as you'd think that things can't possibly get worse, everything would peak in 1977. And that takes us to July 4th, 1977. This is the most profitable time of the year in Chinatown because fireworks are a huge seasonal business. Now remember that the Ping Yuan projects are controlled by Wa Ching and Sing Sui. But for some reason, a Joe boy named Felix Huey, also known as Tiger, was selling fireworks in front of Ping Yuan. And Wa Ching was not happy about this. Later that night, they would approach him and bang. This incident here would set off one of the most famous events in California history. So let me break it down. Joe Fong would hire a man named Carlos John to spy on Wa Ching for months on end. He would follow them around for months until he got the information he needed. One day while he was spying on them in a cafe, he overheard them discussing a gathering on Labor Day at the Golden Dragon restaurant. And once they got this information, the Joe boys would begin planning one of the craziest and worst ideas known to mankind. And that takes us to September 4th, 1977. The Joe boys meet up in nearby Daly City and decide to drive together to the Golden Dragon restaurant. It's five of them in a car together, all bammed up and angry as can be. So they get out of the car and walk in the restaurant. Bang. 
This made national headlines all over the country. And the saddest part is that everyone who didn't make it had nothing to do with watching. This incident was so big that it caused Chinatown to shut down for a long time. Tourists were now scared to visit and locals were scared to go outside. So the entire community came together and decided that something needed to change. So SFPD would start something called the Task Unit, dedicated to stopping watching in the Joe Boy. But it would take a few months before they figured out what really happened. March 24th, 1978. Five people would go down for it. All of which were 17-year-old students at Galileo High School. Curtis Tam got 23 years but ended up getting out in 1991 at the young age of 30 years old. Melvin Yu got life but was released in 2015. Peter Ng got life but was released in 2018. And Tom Yu got life as well but was released in 2014. So that means that everyone involved is currently out and about. But thankfully after this, everything would calm down. By 1983, Chinatown was back to being one of the safest neighborhoods in the city. The Wa Ching versus Joe Boys rivalry benefited no one and we can honestly say that they learned from it and moved on. That would be for everyone except one man, who was actually at the Golden Dragon on September 4th. Let me introduce you to Raymond Chow, also known as Shrimp Boy. And this guy was possibly just as wild as Joe Fong, except that he moved completely differently. Raymond Chow was high ranked in the Hop Sing Tong. And another difference between him and Joe Fong is that he's a team player, and that would be determined in 1989. That's when a powerful man named Peter Chong contacted him. Chong was the head of Wo Hop To Triad, possibly the biggest Hong Kong based organization of all time. And at the time, Wo Hop To wanted to expand to the Bay Area, and they had heard good things about Shrimp Boy so he was chosen to become their West Coast leader. He gladly accepted the powerful role and began expanding quickly. He was making huge money, like unreal amounts that you would never imagine. And on top of this, he was extremely charismatic. Despite having served two sentences from 1980 to 1985 and again from 1986 to 1989, he somehow was not regarded as such. In fact, he was often seen hanging out with Gavin Newsom, Nancy Pelosi, and other politicians. And mind you, this is after serving time for all kinds of crazy things. And during all this, he was getting richer and richer in the streets. Despite the absurd amount of money he was making and shots he was calling, he remained under the radar for 25 years. And this may have been due to Chinatown's quiet state after the 1970s. They were no longer the focus of investigation and Shrimp Boy took full advantage of that. He was seen as the poster child for reformed felons. He gave speeches to the youth, attended government board meetings, and was even featured in commercials. But everything would come falling down in 2014. And that introduces us to a new character. A man by the name of Leland Yi. He was a California state senator known mostly for his harsh stances against video games. Yes, he wanted to ban games like GTA and Call of Duty because he thought they made children crazy. Senator Leland Yi told the SF Chronicle, Gamers have just got to quiet down. Gamers have no credibility in this argument. He was so serious about safety that he introduced a bill that made it illegal to put a for sale sign on your car while it's parked. Anyways, the ambitious senator was actually ambitious in other ways. On March 14th, 2014, big news would come out of Chinatown. Leland Yi was arrested for racketeering, bribery, and all kinds of other charges. The FBI had been wiretapping him for a few months and eventually put his morals to the test. They had undercover agents pretend to be traffickers in the Middle East and they would contact him and offer him $42,000. Leland Yi would agree on the deal and that's all they needed. So much for caring about safety, none of that mattered anymore once the money was put in his pockets. So the FBI decided to raid his office and go through all his records. And that's where they found some important information. Leland Yi was making deals and working alongside Raymond Chow. So on March 26, Raymond Chow was arrested on 162 counts of fraud and racketeering. So after 30 years of being under the radar, the dark side of Chinatown had finally come to the light. Raymond Chow was now doing life. Leland Yi served five years and was released in July of 2020. Today, these organizations are more low-key than ever, but trust me, they are around and they are making money. But on a positive note, Chinatown has been extremely safe over the past 30 years and that's what's most important. But that's gonna do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe and let me know in the comments if you want Baton Rouge Part 2. Peace!